Um, just while people are moving around, can I, I've, I've not got a view box, but we'd like a, just a little show of hands. Um, how many of you feel you're doing a significant number of your exams digitally? Okay, so a few. How many of you have got dedicated systems? Okay, a few again. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Graham Richard Boxer, Head of Education Enhancement at Newcastle University. Um, just to give you a little bit of context here, um, so I started at Newcastle about 10 years ago as a development officer, um, looking after ePortfolio, looking after learning analytics, but at the same time, we, the whole team would contribute to digital exams when it came around, all the checking, all the process, etc. cetera. Um, I then became manager of the team that had digital exams as part of that, as, as his portfolio. And now last year I became head of service and, and Terry, who was meant to be with me today, was the manager of the team. Um, we're at Russell Group University, about 28,000 students, um, 8,000 of those um, postgrad, so about 20,000 undergraduate, about 5,000 staff. Um, last year we did about 240 digital exams. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, sort of vision and strategic drivers around our digital exams. I'm going to talk about the history of exams um, at Newcastle. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges and, and potential solutions that we have. So this is our, our sort of vision that we've got. So it's, it's recognizing, I guess, that exams are not the best way to assess learning outcomes. I think we're probably all aware of that. But while we're not looking to increase the number of exams that we're doing at Newcastle, we are looking to make sure that when we are doing exams, if possible, is done in a digital format. Okay. So our strategic drivers that we've got is thinking about that student experience. So it was interesting when you talk about 30 years of all. I remember 30 years ago, I was sitting in my undergraduate um, exams. Many of you have had similar experiences, all handwritten, all on paper. And my writing is not great. Any spelling errors, lines through it. If I wanted to rearrange something, it was an arrow down the margin. It was just a, just a bit of a mess that you're handing in. And so making sure that that student experience um, of sitting digital exams is, is, is really vital for us. And is the key driver um, and, and something that we're going to keep focusing on. Also improve staff experience of assessment. Um, so by using it in a digital format, they're not carrying around lots of exam scripts, they can do really complex things around marking, et cetera. Um, back in 2018, we, de we developed our education strategy at that point, our five-year plan, um, but we also had a thing called the TEL Roadmap. So the TEL Roadmap was a 3.2 million pound investment in technology-enhanced learning, um, seven different strands of activity that were then embedded into the education strategy. Um, I'm gonna read out the one that's linked to the assessment and, and sort of drove this a little bit. Um, develop and implement comprehensive approaches to online assessment, marking and feedback, making online summative assessment possible across a wide range of assessment types and enabling the wider adoption of electronic submission and marking of all appropriate student assignments. Obviously that second bit about wider adoption of electronic submission and marking and all appropriate student assignments, the pandemic really forced that to happen. And thankfully, we've not gone back to um, paper hand-ins. Um, but th this did give us a focus on the, on the digital exams. And also the desire to increase diversity and authenticity of our assessments. So authentic assessment, I'm sure, is something that you're hearing a lot about at the minute. Um, and we're not trying to suggest that a summative assessment, an exam at the end of your module is a, is a very authentic assessment, but when you're using particular bits of software and you're able to bring in industry standard software that the students have been using the whole year and will be expected to use in employment, the fact you can use that as part of your assessment makes it a lot more authentic than a, than a handwritten essay would be. And then thinking about that management of assessment workflows. Um, I'm sure similar to many of you, we've got lots and lots of different systems at the university, quite a few of them related to assessment. So the fact that we can move data between those systems, especially when, when it's in that electronic format, means that for, for people like professional services colleagues, actually inputting all those handwritten marks when they can just be taken straight across from a system is a really important factor. This is a question that we've got just now. Is, I, is AI going to increase the um, demand for in-person examinations? 
and that's something that, that worries me slightly. Um, we don't want it to increase it. And certainly the, the principles that we developed are, is not um, thinking down that route. But anecdotally, I have heard of schools in the institution that are talking about getting students in a room because there's a way they can, can mitigate against AI. So certainly a concern. Okay, so I'm gonna go back now to the history of um, exams at Newcastle. Um, so back in 2007 was when we did our first exam um, digitally. We were using Blackboard tests. We were using um, Firefox with Grease Monkey scripts to create a lockdown browser. We were using central computer clusters because we had to reboot the whole cluster to turn it into an exam room. Um, the project, we all love an acronym, our project was called OLAF. It was online assessment and feedback. Um, and there was really a couple of things that happened. So we were certainly, we were concerned about the reliability of the essay question in a Blackboard test. And again, this is back in 2007. It wasn't saving your work on a regular basis. So if a student decided to do control, control A and delete, we wouldn't be able to get their work back. I know that's unlikely, but it still meant that we didn't do any essay questions. And so most of the question types were things like multiple choice, multiple answer, and it ended up being mainly stage one students that that would be um, assessing. The other issue we had was around the cluster capacity. So around 2013, we got to a point that during the exam period, the clusters were full. We could not fit any more students in them. So we really had, a, had an issue around that. Um, and also at the same time of doing all this, uh, 2019, just as the pandemic hit, we decided to change our VLE from Blackboard to Canvas. So I had an extra complication on top of all of this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a project that we had called Diversifying Our Exam Provision. And this is really looking at the two issues that I've just highlighted there, the cluster capacity limiting the rooms and the VLE limiting the range of question types that we can do, in particular those SE type questions. And so we ended up looking at this, this pilot. So part of the TEL roadmap funded a post to do a pilot in this area. So, oh, actually I'll go back a slide there. So one of the things that we did for, for the cluster capacity is we looked at bring your own device and whether that was gonna be possible to do and do at scale as well. And with the VLE and limiting the range of question types, we looked to, look to get a dedicated system that would um, be more um, appropriate, let's say, for, for those exams. Outcomes of the pilot that we did. So this is about um, written exams compared to paper exams. And this is the student feedback that we got at the end of the exams. We asked them to complete a quick survey. And so we've got there the 79% of them either said it was better or worse, neither better or worse or better. And then looking at it from a BYOD point of view, again, 84% of students are saying it's neither better or worse or it's better. So really positive feedback from the students who know this is a, a route that we wanted to go down. We got some written feedback as well from the students. And that top left and, and the bottom right one certainly rings true with my experience of doing exams. The fact that you're able to get it legible, the fact that you're able to edit your essay, you're able to put headings in, you're able to move things around, you know, really positive features. Um, I thought the bottom left one was really interesting, thinking about that cyclical process um, that you have when you're writing and actually going back and being able to amend. And again, that, that does hint back to, to my experience as an undergraduate student. And the fact that we're able to use accessibility software and some of the software built into the systems as well have accessibility features really supports uh, all our learners. So following this pilot um, and the success of the pilot, we felt that actually we would go to tender um, for a digital exam system. And this is we uh, in Spira were successful in, uh, in our tender and we have some of the Inspira team at the back here. Um, the tendering happened a little bit later because of the pandemic and we weren't doing any sort of um, examinations um, during the pandemic. And what we've found is the fact that we can do this type test questions, we've had a rapid increase in the number of digital exams and demand for digital exams. Um, we found that with Inspira, it allows a wide range of question types. Um, it allows the typed essays, 
um, really meets the requirements around things like BYOD. Um, it's, you know, you can allow less software. We've had our first exam this year that had multimedia in it. So we, we had video and students with headphones watching video as part of their examination. So a lot more um, wider range of exams that we're able to do using this. Um, so there has been some challenges though, I would say with the software. Uh, certainly not just with the software, there's some issues with the software, some issues with our approach to the implementation and some technical issues at Newcastle, but not elsewhere. So I'll go into those in a bit more detail. Issues with Inspira software is just really about the functionality within the software. So especially when academic areas have been using other software and then have moved to our centrally supported system. I can give an example of in the medical sciences faculty, we've got um, schools that have been using Speedwell. And one of the things that Speedwell does really well is that statistical analysis after the exam. Um, and Inspira doesn't do that as well as Speedwell. So academics have, have voiced their frustration with that. So we're working with Inspira to develop that better and also looking at things like um, Excel templates or Power BI to be able to support um, that. Issues with our approach to implementation. So an example I think falls into this category is thinking about, uh, well, actually we, we got a call one day from one of the schools, I'll not mention which one, um, two days before they're gonna be doing a mock exam with students. They had scheduled the Bring Your Own Device exam in a tiered lecture theater um, first time they'd ever done a digital exam within the school. So we came along, normally what we would want to do is give out information to students, advise them what they need to install in their machines, give them a mock test that they're able to go through on their own machine to check everything works. We weren't able to do any of that. Um, and we ended up having a case for lots of students who were having issues, but because we're in this tier lecture theater, they don't ask everybody else to stand up and then have to come down to the very front. So I think that's what I mean by our approach to implementation in certain aspects. Um, I think we could certainly be improved. And the last one there is technical issues at Newcastle, but not elsewhere. So we looked at remote proctoring. Uh, well, we weren't wanting to do remote proctoring unless there was a particular professional body requirement. Um, we felt that we needed to have something in place in case you know, we ended up going back into another lockdown. Now, with Inspira's um, remote proctoring solution that they've got, we need to use a, a um, browser called, I'm going to say Expedia Exam Portal. I'm looking at the back, see a thumb up from Harvey. So yeah, Inspira Exam Portal, we haven't got that working with our single sign-on. It's just It just hasn't worked. But it does work at other institutions, so we don't know why, and they're working on that just now. Okay, so... Challenges and solutions. And this is where we're at now. So this is the demand currently for digital exams at Newcastle. I've just had a message this morning from Terry to say that we've had the numbers in for next year and it's got the same percentage increase again. Problem we've got though, is we've got no extra resource to deal with all this. Okay, so this is, this is really the big thing we've got just now. We've got two and a half FTE within the service that looks after exams. And during peak times, other people in the team help out, but it really puts so much pressure on those two and a half FTE. One of the things we're doing just now is a strategic review of exams as a whole. And this is our change team within the university is doing that, so outside our department. And they did a mapping exercise. So though you don't need to see the text on all these things, but you've got, this is a Miro board, you've got September through to August, and then these are all the different activities that are needing to be done um, for digital exams. Now, the yellow or the amber is what the academics need to do. The green, these are, this is the greens there, that's what our exam office does. And three guesses, the pink is what we do. So you've got two and a half members of staff doing all that. And it's just causing a lot of pressure uh, and a lot of concern. The other concerns I have about um, the pressure we got is, is when I'm looking at the challenges here. So we've got members of staff within the institution that are absolute experts in assessment. They are brilliant, but they're spending all their time on process. That's all they're doing. 
They don't have time to go out to the schools, talk about assessment best practices, et cetera. So that's a, it's really frustrating. And they're they are frustrated as employees because they're not able to go and share the expertise that they have. This is a concern of mine. It doesn't seem to concern as many people, but it's certainly a concern of mine is that we've got lots of areas of the university responsible for digital exams. So we've got our exams office who looks after paper exams, but they look after the scheduling of digital exams and the invigilation um, recruitment for digital exams. We've got estates involved with our BYOD exams. We've got NUIT involved with our BYOD exams. So a whole load of areas of the university are involved in the exams, and, and that concerns me slightly. Because of that small resource that we've got, and with the increase in exams that we have, I'm really concerned about pressure leading to risks, sorry, leading to errors. And if a student is doing an exam and they have an error with that we've created because of um, our processes or our, our resource constraints, huge impact on that student experience. Well, that is, that is a really concern. And thankfully, we haven't had any major errors yet. I'll touch you with over here. And also colleague experience. Because we're under so much pressure within the team with the demand that we've got, we're not able to spend as much time with colleagues as we would like. And again, if they're not feeling they're getting a great service from us, there's a reputational impact for my department, but also for digital exams as a whole. And they may go back to paper based and um, based on that. So that's a, a worry as well. BYOD is a consistent challenge. Um, we use about four or five rooms at the minute, but we've got to make sure there's enough power. So we've been working with the, with the states in NUIT looking at um, things like power banks, be able to plug them into laptops. We've got laptops that we can swap over with the, the students one if we need to. Um, Wi-Fi is a big issue across the campus. So some areas of campus is great, some areas is not so great. We've got a big network um, re uh, infrastructure rebuild happening just now. So again, we've got to work really closely with other departments to make sure that they, um, that they work well. Looking at our solutions that we've got. So we're currently doing a strategic review of exams. Um, I was expecting something in August, but I'm, I'm assuming it'll be September now with leave. Um, what that leads to, I don't know. It's not certainly going to lead to any new resource. Cost of living at the minute and the, the pressures, financial pressures in the university, we are not able to get more people in the team. So um, I'm interested to see how what, what that actually comes out with. We have a new education strategy due in January. Um, while that strategy is not going to mention digital exams within the strategy, it will talk about assessment as a whole. And so that might be able to lead us um, to doing something around the exam process. And then lastly, it's a bit more of an operational one, this actually is, and, it, and it's something that I think has been a real success is our digital exam support assistance, um, but also employing students um, at peak times. So the digital exam support assistance really is in bring your own device exams. We were finding that the invigilators that we were employing as standard with, with our normal exams tended to be retired school teachers and may not have the digital literacy. Um, I don't want to generalize as a whole because some did, but, but may not have that digital literacy to support any errors the students were having with bring your own device. Um, the other problem I had is they were trying to solve an error with the, with the device they weren't able to keep an eye on the room and their job really is to make sure that exam runs properly and is rigorous, et cetera. Um, so we employ PhD students as digital exam support assistants. They have to have a level of uh, you know, technical ability um, and they will go into the rooms and support the invigilators and deal with any technical issues that come up on BYOD exams. The other thing that we do have is we have PhD students coming in actually helping the team with the process elements around exams. So they'll do things like checking of settings, um, you know, and, and sort of release dates, all these sorts of things that we, we do as a part of our process. It's been really successful. The students are fantastic, dedicated. They do a great job. I've got real concerns about it though. Um, my concern really is that we are getting people to come and help out on a short term. It'll be a new person next time, a new person next time. And while it's been successful as a bit of a sticky plaster, I don't feel that's a long-term solution to the problems that we've got. 
Okay, and so that is our really summary of where we are with digital exams. Um, probably not as many solutions as I would like to give you, but I think if we maybe spoke about this in a year's time, hopefully I will. How to take any questions from me? Yeah, well, with the maths, we, we develop at Newcastle, and it's actually it's open source now, and use the, you, some of you, and I'm sure, use it as a tool called Numbers. Yeah. Um, so, Numbers is really used for all our mathematic exams. We don't, we don't really do anything through um, Inspira for that. Um, we do have areas like computing, et cetera, using exams, but just not for those particular mathematical elements. When they do need to do some sort of element of handwriting, Inspira have a bit of functionality called Inspira Scan. Um, and so they, we, they get given a bit of paper and it's all scanned in at the end and linked, digitized and linked to their particular submission. Anybody else? Yeah, we have a certain number of laptops and that we have university laptops. So if the device stops working, we can flip the new laptop across. And once they log in, the exam will just pick up exactly where they've been. If they lose Wi-Fi connection, the software will still run and still manage. And actually, when they then get connected back to the Wi-Fi again, it'll upload it again. So it's, there's lots of functionality built in built into the software, as well as what we're doing in the rooms. Um, just a follow-on question. Um, what sort of proportion of students do you find needs an additional laptop, whether they're in the series or in the is it a, a, a small number? Yeah, it is. It, it does tend to be. I don't, I don't have figures, but it is a small number that we've got. The, the problem actually we've got with that is the more it grows and the more venues we are doing the BYOD for, then the more laptops we have to get out to those venues. So we're having to work really closely with NUIT. Other issues we've had, for example, is our, our suite of laptops are only used during exam periods. So when they're off the network for a certain length of time, they drop off, you can't reconnect and they can't do updates, et cetera. So we've got to really work with NUIT and make sure they're regularly switched on, updated, and then brought out to the venues. So the more we do the BYOD, that's the sort of logistical challenge that we're going to have. Richard. Um, could you say something about assistive technology and how you deal with um, student um, needs and that next step? Yeah, so there's certainly there's some uh, functionality within Inspira that, that allows us to, to do some accessibility um, elements. Allow listing of software will allow us to, to use some of the assistive software as well. There has been circumstances, though, where we just had to make it not a lockdown through the system. And actually, we have to have an invigilator for that student based on an open, almost like an open book exam type thing. So. You get to so who coordinates that so you anticipate student needs because some students declare and have support plans, mm -hmm. others don't, and particularly for postgraduate international students, we've seen in Europe, you know, a lot of them they don't come with that culture of declaring, okay, you know, a short time before the exam, suddenly you, you get to hear about their, their, their challenges or the software they're using. So, how is that all coordinated? We, we are led by the exams office that that. So, you know, registration of students against a particular exam and their requirements is there. I, I really is an assumption for me. I'm assuming they're coordinating with student wellbeing service and, and those things in place. Um, not something I've had raised to me as a major issue that we're finding. Um, but yeah, could go undetected, I guess. Oh. Question about, I guess, the more the beginning of the process that you were talking about. And and obviously you ended up with Inspira, but did you, were you looking into any other platforms? Could you tell yeah. us about that? Absolutely. I mean, when we, when we did the pilot, the pilot wasn't with Inspira. The pilot, we used WiseFlow um, as our pilot. And the pilot really wasn't about the system. It was about proving that we can actually do that, you know, what, what we needed to do. Um, when we can do the, the thing with WiseFlow that students really didn't like, and I don't know if it's still the same with the software or not, but back, at, back then it was... You could do a multiple choice and an essay question, but you'd have to do the multiple choice first, finish it, submit it, and then do your essay question. You couldn't then go back into your multiple choice questions. And that's something the students felt that actually, if you're doing that part A and part B, when you're working on part B, you actually think, oh, hold on, my answer to part A is wrong. I'll go back and change that. 
but they couldn't do that with our software. Um, but yeah, the tendering, very robust tendering um, sort of process that we went through, student, student input as well as staff, um, as well as ourselves. And yeah, Inspira came out clear winners with that. And how are you talking about a particular academic or group and they only gave you two days notice for the exam? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Because I can imagine for a lot of students, their anxiety levels might go up if they weren't prepared. So I think they had a try. And how did you go about helping academics understand better? Well, I think, I mean, yeah, I think that, that was just one example, I guess, of the sort of uh, implementation issues that we've got. In that particular scenario, um, as well as the students being frustrated, we were really frustrated because we weren't able to give the support that we would normally want to give. I think following that, we've really worked with deans, worked with faculties, et cetera, to make sure that if people, and if it was an end of year summative exam, we would have got it through the exams office, so we would have got it well in advance. It was the fact it was a mock exam that they had organized themselves within the school. And that's that. That's really the the scenario we had. So yeah, it's really just a communication thing, and really trying to make sure that schools are are aware and on board with these things. Just one other one around. You know how you got a new strategy coming in January twenty twenty four. Yeah. All these different groups that um, are relying on each other in this exam space. Is mm. that something that we're you're going to be asked to work more together? Um, we do. I mean, we work really closely together already. I'm just really worried about it being a whole load of different groups. Um, I think the education strategy will be will be broader. Um, we'll we'll talk about what we want to do as a university around assessment. I'd imagine things like ethnic assessment will be in there, for example. I don't think it will go into that to the detail of what we're doing around exams um, as such. One or two more minutes if anyone wants to stay and ask any other questions. But thank you very much, Graham, and thank you for Rich Hogan and Thank you. Thank you.